you're able to see that. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to stay on all day, I hope you have stamina to listen to yet more stories. But I thought I would begin with a story since the title sounds rather you know, serious, addressing the youth mental health crisis in and out of our emergency rooms. And I thought I would begin with a story. So let me just make sure I can advance these slides. So just a few disclosures, no commercial disclosures to make, no potential conflicts, but some grant funding. So I thought before I tell you my learning objectives, I would begin with a little bit of a story since I have a 41 plus year perspective sitting here on Long Island uh, doing the work that I do. And when I arrived at uh, Long Island Jewish Medical Center uh, in 1982, we had about 250 child psychiatric emergencies per year in our emergency service, it was about 20 kids a month. That meant that some weekdays we had one, occasionally we had two, many we had none. And so child psychiatric emergencies wasn't a separate rotation. It didn't have dedicated staff. It was often linked with whoever was on call for CL or the ER, uh, and they would do that occasional consult. And we could generally accommodate the follow-up of all these kids in our ambulatory services without too much difficulty because the volume of about 20 a month, half of them often had pre-existing uh, care already in the community. So the other half, 10 or so per month, we could absorb into our ambulatory clinic. Well, that was 1982. By the year 2000, which was 18 years later, the number had risen to about 2,000 a year. And by then, the, the chairman of the department was pediatrics, was already complaining to the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry that there were too many kids in the pediatric emergency service. And I know that this is a familiar refrain from all of you. This wasn't a Long Island phenomenon. This was unfortunately a child mental health reality. Well, as we all know, that was the year 2000. And by the year 2010, we were seeing about 4,000. Well, in 2009, the chairman of pediatrics said, Victor, you got to do something. This is not sustainable. The ER has more behavioral health kids and physically sick kids, it feels like, and it's too many, too many. And so at that point, we had already worked with the New York State Office of Mental Health to develop a collaborative care program to try to train pediatricians in child mental health so that many of the mild to moderate kids that were in our ambulatory service, we could try to refer back to primary care. Now, many primary care pediatricians said, we don't want these kids. I don't want to take care of their ADHD and mild anxiety. If I wanted to be a child psychiatrist, I would have become one. But we, we really didn't have much of a choice. We had to really clear the clinic of the stable, worried, well kids and refer them back to primary care as best we could or to other community resources. And by doing so, we really created capacity in our ambulatory service for the more acute cases that were coming into the ER so that we could take care of them. So that was about 2000. And shortly before the pandemic, about 2015, so five years before the pandemic, there was some seed money that the Office of Mental Health offered to create an urgent care system. Because by 2015, we realized that the vast majority of children under 12, 95 to 98% of them, who came to our ER were treated and released. And most of them did not require an emergency room, but they did require an urgent evaluation. And about 75% of the adolescents 13 to 17 who came to our ER were treated and released. And so with the seed money, we created this. And so now I'll go through my objectives, kind of with that historical perspective, taking you now back to about 10 years ago, or almost 10 years ago. So I wanna talk about the crisis in our emergency psychiatry care in the context of this nationwide youth mental health crisis that we're in summarize what we've done over the past 10 years here 
at the Cohen Children's Medical Center on Long Island. And we benefited from learning from our colleagues in Cincinnati and Columbus and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, really talk about how the information that we review may be relevant to your own institution and to see what you might be able to do to innovate or create model programs. So we all know what the concern has been, uh, that there are so many adverse experiences that children are exposed to uh, and uh, all of the concerns about all the risks that lead to suicide being the second leading cause of death in this age group. And as I tell people, and as all of you know, it's not easy for a kid to grow up. And uh, it's a challenging time for a child these days. And so with all of this as our concern, even prior to the pandemic, we created this urgent care system where kids could come in to uh, an urgent care in the lobby of the children's hospital. And it was really for kids that didn't require medical clearance. And they were brought in by a family member, a guardian or a parent. And uh, they weren't brought by the police. They weren't brought by ambulance. And in the first year, we saw almost a thousand kids. Let's see if I can advance the slide. So all of this covers what we already know, that there's both a dramatic increase in pediatric emergency visits for decades, and the workforce shortage has never been more severe. And we, we understand that the symptoms of serious concern have been increasing over time. And so that's what led to the ER is being inundated everywhere, not just here on Long Island, although at times we had to remind our administration this was a national phenomenon, not something that was unique to our organization because schools were increasingly concerned. And so we developed this urgent care model and we recognized that we had to have the word out. So. We knew in the emergency room as kids were coming in that once they registered in the emergency room, they had to be seen. So we had information boards and education in school districts to educate about our urgent care availability. And schools began to tell families if they needed an urgent evaluation, they could come without an appointment to our urgent care system. And that first year, we saw about a thousand kids who would otherwise have been seen in our emergency room. And we realized that the model could be very effective. And those kids were primarily uh, treated and released. And we created what was what is now called an open access to our ambulatory program so that kids who didn't have prior linkage to a mental health provider could be referred to our clinic since I had cleared out the clinic much to the dismay of my faculty who now we're dealing with much more acute cases and their stable caseload has been primarily referred back to the community. And so every Tuesday and Wednesday, it's all hands on deck for anybody who's been seen in urgent care in the previous week. And so we can offer a linkage appointment uh, for those families who wish that in our child psychiatry ambulatory service. So we went from first helping to develop collaborative care for New York State in a program called Project Teach, which was created in 2009. And that so we had a network of primary care docs who we could refer cases back to. Then we created the urgent care system, and that really required us to have a place to refer kids for linkage, because we couldn't just provide urgent care without having a place to make linkage. Now, the volume of the urgent care was such that we couldn't see all the kids, but we then really worked with all the community agencies in our region to try to make sure that we could get a linkage appointment for anyone seen in urgent care who didn't already have a previous mental health provider. So after the first year, we realized that 
the volume was such that we couldn't keep up with more volume in the same urgent care. And so at that time, there was some seed money made available through a government grant uh, to develop a relationship with schools. And so the first school-based program created an opportunity for uh, seven school districts to participate. And basically we created an additional urgent care in a pediatric setting owned by the health system in the community and seven school districts that neighbor that pediatric practice would contribute a certain amount of their budget to support this urgent care. And at first there was a reluctance and then schools recognized that for those districts, uh, they could get a great deal of service available in the community uh, without an appointment for families who otherwise would have been sent to the emergency room. So the first school-based clinic urgent care opened with a partnership with seven local school districts and some seed money. And we all know that why this was so much better because the emergency room can be a concern. You wait a long time and many of these kids don't really require emergency room. They need an urgent evaluation. And we all know what happened during the pandemic with the dramatic increase. So we don't know what we would have done had we not already developed urgent care with the schools. We know about the crisis, so I'm not going to review it. But this slide demonstrates that <clears throat> what we tried to do was reflect the percentage of kids seen in different settings as we developed urgent care. And uh, the important thing for us was that we wanted uh, to demonstrate that the total volume of kids that used to be served exclusively in the emergency room were now being provided care in a split way. Those, many of them that were less acute were seen in the urgent care setting and many were, uh, and the others who required either because they had a medical need for clearance or they were brought in by police or ambulance or they were not accompanied by parent or guardian were still brought to the emergency room. And so the, the model that we created allowed for us to be able to monitor, you know, what's happening uh, with these patients who come uh, to urgent care uh, the vast majority of them uh, were uh, treated and released. Uh, very, very few of the urgent care patients ever got admitted, uh, whereas uh, the kids who were 13 to 17 who went to the emergency room now had a higher rate of hospitalization because this was a distilled group of more acute kids. And the first few years with the one urgent care in the children's hospital and one in the community partnering with seven school districts turned out to be a very successful model. And uh, the schools were very pleased and the word went out. And before we knew it, we had more school districts asking us for partnership. We developed universal screenings in our urgent care so that we could really make certain that we understood the population and we introduced uh, evidence-based interventions both for substance use, firearm uh, prevention, child abuse screening, as well as human trafficking screening. We trained the staff in terms of best practices. In the urgent care system, we really rarely had to use uh, any of the uh, pathways because these kids were much less acute. This was primarily for the emergency room, where now the acuity was percentage-wise more acute. And we demonstrated that by having uh, this training for both uh, managing aggression, uh, we dramatically reduced uh, the kinds of uh, concerns we had in terms of 
length of stay, uh, restraint use uh, by having aggression training for the staff. So we think the care in the emergency also improved dramatically in terms of those metrics. We also worked very carefully, uh, certainly to make sure we had the right culture of care that was equitable and patient-centric. And these uh, urgent care areas uh, really were uh, in primary care settings, uh, not stigmatizing. I don't think the word psychiatry was anywhere present. So families were really going to a pediatric uh, clinic where we would have a behavioral health urgent care. And these are embedded in the community, in, in pediatric practices. We created programs for neurodiversity to help because many of these were on the autism spectrum. And we trained a group of our behavioral health care specialists into something we call patient engagement specialists, which are PBS. And these were people who were already the mental health workers, but had been identified as having particular skill for de-escalation and engaging patients. And with these patient engagement specialists, we've been able to dramatically uh, improve the care, reduce the need of constant observation, reduce the amount of restraints, because they have a very uh, engaging and therapeutic relationship with the adolescents and their families. So that's really been a big plus for our entire department. We also did some trainings with simulation on what to do in case somebody does need to be restrained. And so there was a much greater sense of doing things uh, in an organized way. And we really worked very closely to actively uh, educate and work with families so that we would try to really uh, build resilience in these kids. So from the first urgent care in our children's hospital, Two years later, we had a second one in the community with seven school districts. And the following year, a third one opened with another eight school districts. And those have turned out to be very, very successful models. We now have three community urgent care. Uh, each are funded in part by funding from each of the respective school districts, uh, as well as some hospital uh, expense as well in the budget. And um, patients' insurances are billed for the services. No one's turned away for inability to pay. And we accept whatever the insurance does reimburse for the urgent care. And so it's really been a very successful model. Uh, it doesn't make money, but it provides access to care uh, for youth who otherwise would have needed to be seen in an emergency room. The school districts are very pleased. Uh, so now we have three community urgent care with a fourth one being developed uh, and discussions about other regional urgent care in collaboration with the school district. And so it's now become something that the school districts are asking for. Uh, and uh, of course we have the, the main urgent care located in the children's hospital that one does not have any uh, relationship with uh, school districts. It's open to everyone. But we, we know that uh, we really have done the best we can uh, to make sure that everybody has uh, follow-up care, even though uh, we can't make, it's not 100%. Um, <clears throat> we do safety planning for all youth school and it's embedded within our EMR. Uh, we also have worked with families to introduce uh, safety planning for them, including safety planning checklists. And <clears throat> we're always looking at uh, how we can improve our scheduling and our, our care. And the schools here in the school program are particularly uh, pleased. We now have partnerships uh, with about 20 
five school districts on Long Island and um, many more that are requesting it. And so it's really been an opportunity for us to really minimize unnecessary inappropriate emergency room visits to provide rapid urgent care for children and adolescents who otherwise would have gone to an emergency room. And the schools are getting um, education. Many of our faculty and staff who are doing in-service trainings for the school districts on a variety of mental health topics, many of which they request. And so the sense is really true of a real collaboration between pediatrics and the school districts. And so uh, it's really been a, a very powerful uh, way to really form close linkage with the community. So um, there's obviously many things available in the community for crisis management, but our behavioral health urgent care together with the comprehensive school partnerships has really been uh, something that we are continuing to develop. We've had requests from programs around the country asking us how to develop it. My colleague, Dr. Vera Foyer, who's the director of the emergency room and has really been instrumental in developing this, couldn't be with me this evening because she's on her way to Nationwide Children's Hospital to present this work there tomorrow. But certainly, I know that both Vera Foyer and myself would be happy to uh, have any questions that people have about the development of these behavioral health urgent care, as well as uh, the ways in which to uh, partner with school districts uh, in order to create these community urgent care that really serve the school districts and really take care of the youth in the community without having to uh, utilize the emergency room uh, in an inappropriate fashion. So it's certainly something that we uh, are happy to to talk about tonight, as well as to talk about in the future for anybody who has interest. So this, of course, is what we hope we've been able to accomplish. Uh, it's urgent access. We engage with the family. We have child psychiatry present. We coordinate care, and then we provide aftercare linkage for everyone who comes to our program. At least we make effort to. As I said, it's a team with the child psychiatrist. Uh, each of the urgent care centers have a licensed mental health counselor, a patient engagement specialist who is really a mental health worker who's gotten extra training. We've been able to make this a very sought after rotation for medical students, residents in pediatrics and child psychiatry and general psychiatry. Uh, we have a medical scribe and a financial registrar. And so all of this works uh, to staff each of the urgent care models. Most of them are staffed from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. One of them in the community is open some evenings until 8 p.m. They have a request for us to lengthen the hours, and I think that's something we're hoping to do in the future. Right now, they're primarily open during school hours on 9 to 4. So certainly, we know that uh, based on the various components of uh, where kids are, that of course we will always like to work with prevention. And we hope that we can try to intervene earlier with the school consultations and behavioral interventions so that we can try to avert those youth who might otherwise end up uh, being higher risk and ending up in the emergency room. And I think that with working closely with schools, uh, that we're hoping to demonstrate that this has been something that we can uh, show. Real quick, sorry to jump in. Just want to note, we just got a couple minutes left. Thank you, sir. Okay. So we, we've been able to decrease our emergency by partnering with these school districts by 60%. It takes about seven and a half days on average from referral to make an appointment for follow-up. So we've been able to arrange linkage. And 95% of the students connect with them three months to ongoing care in the community. 
and 90% of the school professionals reported significant value with 97 reported satisfaction with all the training programs that we're providing to the school professionals. So these, this is the timeline of our various urgent care. The first one opened here in, in 2017. It was developed in 2016. Uh, and uh, the various school districts that we have since partnered with uh, over time. And as I said, there's now plans in 2024 to develop uh, yet another uh, behavioral health urgent care in the community. I remind long, everyone that Long Island has its name because it's indeed long. It's 120 miles from the mouth of Brooklyn to the tip of Montauk. And so across that 120 miles, there's about 9 million people. And so it's a rather highly populated area. And uh, certainly uh, the school districts uh, really prefer having the care embedded within the community. I'm not going to go through all the clinical dashboard. You can obviously have this, uh, but we've been able to really uh, have a profound impact on uh, the emergency room by having the capacity of uh, these urgent care, as you can see. So the total volume of cases seen in 2022 was 8,000. Let's see what 2023 will be. Remember, I got here in 1980. Two and they were 250 a year. So now there's 8,000. However, as you can see, the volume of cases in the emergency room uh, has now really been dramatically uh, improved. It's still 3,000 cases in the ER, but compared to what it might have been, this is a big improvement. Here are some references, and certainly I'm happy to take any questions at any 